Alright, girls and boys, welcome back to our show, our series on LA performing artists. Performing artists in the LA area, mostly musicians, who are influential in the new music scene. When I say new music, we can decide over time, over this series, what we really mean by that. That means so many things. So today, we have impresario, bon vivant, composer, trombonist, arranger, Michael Vladkovich. How are you, Michael? I am well. Jim Dandy, as they say. Jim Dandy, full of candy. That's good. Well, let's start out, Michael, with you telling us a little bit, or a lot, as is your want, about your early life your early background, where you were born, where you grew up, your early musical experiences, that kind of thing. Um, I was born in St. Louis, Missouri, a town which I'm not particularly fond. Um, my parents were not musicians, although they were incredibly um, enthusiastic about uh, helping me do the things that I would wish to do. I started playing trombone in the third grade and I took I took private lessons with uh, with saxophone players. The band director I had band directors who were saxophone players. Uh, the, the grade school band he was a saxophone player and, and then the high school was also a saxophone player. I didn't start taking uh, lessons from a trombone player until until I guess maybe my sophomore year of high school, I guess. Maybe. Let me uh, interrupt you for a minute. Was that... Uh, did that have any influence on just the aspects of playing brass instruments, did the saxophone players harm you in any way? Um, not to my knowledge. I mean, I, I'm I'm not a gearhead, uh, meaning that I'm not really into, uh, say, somebody like em Emery Remington or something. You know, who was incredibly uh, precise about. You know how you how your embouchure is created and and all of that sort of stuff. I just did it, <laughs> and mm -hmm. fortunately for me and for them, I guess, I did it well enough that it worked, and still, and still works. So, uh -huh. how did you uh, choose the trombone? Was it you just saw it and wanted to play it, or you heard it, or it was what they offered you? What was that about? That I honestly don't remember. Um, I suppose because of my size it was a, an instrument uh, that would have been offered. Um, you were a tall kid? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was very tall. Yeah, so I would have been offered that instrument. Although I must say that that line of reasoning is pretty ridiculous because there's only four notes. <laughs> There's two notes in seventh position and two notes in sixth position that you can play. So for people in the audience who don't understand what we're talking about, the trombone, you, it's a slide and you have to have reach. Yeah, your arm, your arm has to extend and, and, and the, the reasoning was often that the child's arm wasn't long enough to reach sixth or seventh position so they shouldn't play that instrument. But what I'm saying is that there were only two notes in each of those, a grand total of four notes that they wouldn't be able to play out of very numerous notes that they could play. But they might be the four golden notes. Well, yeah, I suppose. They have those kind of rationalizations for a lot of instruments. You know, they, they want a big kid to play the tuba where it, Tuba has nothing to do with your size. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you're a little kid, you get a small tuba. And you have to learn how to breathe, no matter what. People's lung capacity is really not that yeah. different. Right. You know, it's really not that different. I see. Okay, so um, you were telling us you, you had studied with saxophone players. 
and uh, then you move to a trombone player. I see. Okay, go ahead. Pick so, up wherever you want. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, um, well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll deviate here for a second. Um, in sixth grade, I started playing saxophone because I wanted to uh, play in some popular bands, and trombone was not an instrument that occurred in popular bands. So I played, I played saxophone, and started playing saxophone in sixth grade, and and um, while I was still playing trombone, and um, played in some. Uh, I, I would. They were in certain neighborhood type bands. They weren't really um, bands that I later played in. That that were more uh, made up of uh, musicians from around the city. So, the you say popular music. You mean rock and roll? Rock and roll. Mean? Yeah, uh, R and B sort of. Yeah, uh, that sort of music. Contemporary music of the time on the radio. So you had access to a saxophone via the public school system, or did your parents rich you? Well, they, they uh, yeah, they got me a saxophone. I uh, they your parents? You mean? Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So oh, it was a Queen supportive. On Queen On saxophone. Uh, Queen On saxophone, French. Yeah. Yes, or freedom, depending on what's going on in the world <laughs> at the time, depending on the politics of the situation. Yeah. I see. So you were, um, this was sixth grade, you say? Yeah. So you were performing in groups that early. Were they gigging groups or were they just playing in the garage or? Well, it was, it was mostly garage type stuff, you know, playing at somebody's house or something or other. Were your colleagues your age or yeah. were they older? Yeah, they were around my age. They might be, you know, a couple of years older, but... But, yeah, we were all approximately the same age. That's very enterprising, sixth grade. So that's like 12 years old. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Yeah. yeah. So. so you've been playing trombone since third grade. That's a long time. Yeah, it is. It is a long time. Because you're not 25 anymore. No. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't... I don't know. I guess it's made a difference, being you know having played that instrument for so long. I mean, there were periods of time where you know I I was uh, half-heartedly playing it. I suppose I wasn't practicing that seriously. I didn't really what? seriously start practicing until uh, until I until I started uh, with the trombone teacher, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would, I would play the trombone and try to play the trombone, certainly, in practice, but, but the, uh, the uh, enthusiasm, I don't know if enthusiasm is the right word, uh, it, the, uh, I was more focused at that point in trying to uh, Trying to figure out really how to play the instrument. I see. So you've been playing that instrument for five decades. Yeah. Over five decades. At this point, do you just get tired of it? Or the times when it's like, you know, the last thing you want to do in the world is play the trombone? No, I don't uh, I don't get tired of playing the trombone. The the problem the problem that I that I have sometimes is that, uh, and this occurs primarily with improvisation. I'm um, I'm in a situation that's that's just so ridiculously easy for me to to do that I really dislike it because it's it's so because it's so easy it's so difficult. To try to figure to out focus. To try to figure out something that's different to keep your interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's so it's so incredibly easy for me to to do certain things that it it just uh, it just drives me nuts. 
Hmm. I guess maybe um, you once said to me, you want to play the most difficult music you can find, which is just anathema to me. I want to play the easiest music I can come across. Perhaps that uh, your feeling comes from what you just said. Well, uh, that, that statement is somewhat misleading um, because um, difficult, difficult doesn't just necessarily refer to technique. Uh, difficult refers to a whole lot of other issues in terms of, you know, musicality. Mm -hmm. And and I would I would say that um, that probably is difficulty probably is more I'm more interested in that sort of difficulty than I am in in technical things. Although I, I certainly appreciate uh, people who are capable of of playing with precision at uh, the with you know, with uh, uh, things that are really difficult, uh -huh. technically. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's uh, go back to St. Louis. <laughs> St. Louis. Not one Beer of your favorite town. towns. Beer town, sports. Neither one of those things I was involved, so... It what was... does that mean, a beer town? That they make beer there or they drink a lot of it? Or both? Well, Anheuser-Busch. Ah. Anheuser-Busch was was there. Anheuser-Busch was the was the first man to to figure out that uh, it was best to control every aspect of the beer market. So he mm. uh, he did all of it. <laughs> he did bottling. He did the you know the transport. He did everything. And Why do you know that? Because you're from St. Louis, or yeah, yeah. I see. Uh, anyway, Anheuser Busch, uh, they don't own the company anymore, but uh, yeah, it was a beer town and, and, and sports. And neither of those things uh, have ever interested me, so I was, I was the person with the brown shoes and the tuxedo all of the time. What does that mean, the brown shoes and the tuxedo? The tuxedo wasn't brown, was it? No. So, so what were you on about? Well, I, I really, I really felt always uh, very odd. I never, I never really felt like I fit in. Uh -huh. I always, it was always uh, very strange for me. Um, so you know, it it uh, it took a long time to figure all that stuff out. Do you feel like you fit in now? You're in Los Angeles now. Actually, you go between Los Angeles and Portland and St. Louis and Seattle. You're one of the most traveled yeah. guys on the planet. Yeah. Um, well, certainly uh, a lot more than I did. I, uh, I fortunately really um, deal primarily with with people you know the creative people so so it's it's e easier easier for me not uh -huh. that the not that the other people want to deal with me anyway uh -huh. I don't think they do huh the other people in the world yeah the you may be better ones. off <laughs> yeah you may be really. better off so you're in St. Louis through high school yeah, through high school, I uh, I got a scholarship to go to a, a very, 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 very small college called St. Louis Institute of Music, and uh, I went there for several semesters, and then I transferred to uh, North Texas State, which was a very, 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 very big school. So I went from one extreme to the other. Uh huh. Uh huh. Tell us a little bit about your neighborhood in St. Louis. Did were you basically in the same neighborhood all the time you were there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I. Uh, well. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. That's yeah, that's absolutely true. Until I until. Um, 
I went to North Texas State. My parents stayed in the same same house. They moved. They moved after that to another location. But uh, yeah, so I was uh, I was in a, a suburb. Was your neighborhood mixed, or was it pretty much white folks, or what was it? Because St. Louis is kind of segregated, or was kind of segregated. I think St. Louis is still very segregated. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it was uh, it was white predominantly, uh, if not completely. What about your high school? Was that the same? Um, the high school was. Um, there were uh, a couple of a couple of blacks and uh, maybe one Latin. I don't think there were any Asians, but I don't. Maybe think. half of one. Yeah, <laughs> so, maybe. Since you're such low numbers. Yeah, of yeah. Folks, it was. Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was it, it was uh, an interesting thing. Were there a lot of music activity at your high school, or just the typical marching band? And was it a big marching band? What what was that like? What kind of support did the school system give you? Well, I'll, I'm not particularly interested in talking about the high school, but other than to say that it was a weird place because it was a military school. It was a military private school. Private military school. Oh, a private military school. Yeah. This is news to me. So it was a very strange place. And it was so it was just a, it was just a marching band. Although huh. he although he did um, he did do big band stuff a little bit, but not a whole lot. Okay, well since you've thrown me a big hint that you're not particularly interested in talking about that. We will leave it be. That band uh, went to uh, the Mardi Gras, though. Ah. We, we marched in the Mardi Gras parade, and did that do anything for you? Marching in that parade, going down there, seeing that different kind of life, sort of, I would imagine, being different. Um. Well, it was it was a, it was an interesting experience because this was you know the '60s, so. Um, things were still somewhat, somewhat tame in, in the sense of, of parades anyway. People were pretty well behaved. I mean, they were putting beads on you and stuff. They weren't, uh, you know, throwing uh, rocks at you or uh, charging you. Charging you? You mean charging at you or you yeah, mean the cops char charging? Charging at you, yeah. Ah. I see. I see. Okay, so you went to uh, this conservatory in St. Louis. Yeah. Well, just uh, tell us about your musical development from those early days to where you are now. You know, people you figure are influences. Actually, before you do that, why don't you spend a little time telling us what you do now, and then we'll get to how you got here. Okay. Um, well, basically what I do now is attempt to uh, record uh, and perform music that I've written over the years, composed over the years. Um, so that's essentially what I do now. Um, is that a wide range of music, a wide range of styles, or tell us a little bit about what your music uh, is? Well, let's see, when did that, um, I'm trying to remember, um, well, in the, uh, in the early 70s, I was uh, I was very influenced by um, Don Ellis. Uh. There were a lot of there were a lot of people, uh, Gil Evans, another, but um, and I was writing what I what, what I would call programmatic music, 
that was that was orchestrated and and um, I had a band and um, so I was writing a fair amount of music for that band at that time. Are you in Los Angeles at this time? Yeah. Uh -huh. Then. Did you play with Don Ellis? No, I never played with Don Ellis. Uh -huh. I did uh, try to get him to play my music, but I never, uh, never played with him. Did he ever play your music? No, he never uh, did. Did he play other people's music? Uh, one he did, or he did Hank Levy music. Mm -hmm. Hank Levy was a, a guy who used to teach in in Maryland, um, Baltimore, Maryland. I forget what the school is there in Baltimore, Maryland. The trumpet player. Peabody. No, the no. trumpet player is uh, has the has the job now. Whose name I can't think of either. Anyway, um, I I wanted I wanted much more freedom in the music, and and so what happened was I I started writing writing two part music that. It didn't matter what instruments played. It's, you didn't. You didn't have to call up and get a drummer or a bass player. It wasn't required. The ensemble wasn't specific, so you could. You could. You could call up anybody to play, and and, and I was very curious about that. So. Um, I started developing that concept. And then, as as time went on, um, I um, honed, I guess is a word, um, that particular two part writing, and and then began to incorporate what I had done in the past as well, <clears throat> and ended up to where I am now. Uh, so it's. To answer your question, it's it's a combination of both. There's uh, there's some recording that is that is very orchestrated and notated, and then other that's pretty loose and mm -hmm. and uh, minimalistic in terms of of what what's written. It's mostly improvisation. Let's um, spend a little time. That two part writing on the face of it, what you described. I would imagine to uh, a lot of people sounds easier to do it, but in fact, it's harder when when you start writing for when you start writing music that for any instrument to play as opposed to specific instruments. At least for me, it actually ends up being more difficult because you have to uh, when you know the instruments you're writing for, you have a whole set of uh, limitations and knowledge about the instrument. <clears throat> Plus, I often have a uh, conception of color related, you know, that I want the pieces to have, such as that. But when I write for uh, indeterminate instruments that you, music, any instrument can play, it's, it actually becomes more difficult for me. Did you find that, at least in the beginning? Um. Well, there's there's two parts. Um, the first part is I I do find I do find successful two part writing to be difficult because there's only two parts, and and you have to use those people uh, precise in in the in the precise way to create the ult ultimate bang for your buck. Um, so. That in that sense is difficult, um, or can be difficult. Uh, regarding regarding the other aspects, the mood and and the and that sort of stuff, the range and um, what happened over a per over a period of time was I. I decided that I, I wanted the music to have a relationship to the subject that I was writing about. And the only way 
I saw to do that convincingly for me was to transpose the subject into musical pitches and use that as the as the composition. Uh, so what happens when I do that is I often lose control over the outcome in terms of of whether it's going to sound Japanese or whether it's going to sound uh, you know like an R and B or whatever, because my my major uh, my major issue is figuring out how to get that row to work in some musical way. So the relationships between the, the the relationships between the pitches cause uh, create tonalities and create <coughs> um, tension and release sort of things. So you have to you have to spend time figuring out how to how, what's the most uh, what's the best way to get those pitches to work. So. <clears throat> That's ultimately all I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to get it to sound like the Seine River or, or you know, a man eating pizza on the on a on a spaceship. Uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to get the notes to sound good <laughs> in the order that they're, that I am dealing. <clears throat> so that's that's uh, that's the story with that. Well, we we kind of left something out for folks who don't know. I mean, it was there, but when you say the subject and then you go to pitches, I know that what you mean is you have titles and you transpose, you assign pitches to the letters of the title. Is that that's what you're talking about, correct? Uh, that's usually the case. Sometimes it's it's not the title. The subject isn't the title. The subject is something else. Uh -huh. Let's say the subject is Rhonda, but mm -hmm. the title of the piece is. Uh, you have blue eyes. Uh huh. I got you. But the su the subject is Rhonda, and the tone row is based on Rhonda, uh -huh. not the subject. Uh -huh. Not you have blue eyes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so the tone row based on Rhonda is a -H -O -N -D -A, pitch for each yeah. letter. I see. I see. And that has served you well over the years. Although anyone who has played Michael's music or bought his CDs and listened to it has to cannot help but be uh, impressed by the titles that he has for his pieces. How do you, how do you feel about titles? Me, I'm very, um, titles mean a lot to me. That You know, in my music, they tell a lot about what the piece is. I, I wouldn't say my pieces are necessarily programmatic, but they do come from a conceptual narrative basis between my ears, so the titles really really matter and hopefully they offer something to the listener how do you since you since you have such elaborate titles and such sometimes such witty titles tell us a little bit how you feel about those titles and how you come up with them well uh, a good a good many of them are found titles are uh, manipulated a little bit um, and the titles, the titles um, are are really a means to an end. So I prefer longer titles uh, because I have more material with which to work. Um, but the but as I as I previously said, the title title doesn't necessarily mean anything. In relationship to the music, the title is just a name there. If you wish to create some sort of um, relationship between the music and the title, besides what I said about the notes, uh, then that's you're free to do that. I I think I prefer to do that with all music, regardless of whether. 
whether it does have a specific meaning or not. I, I always found it found it difficult to only have one meaning for something, whether it be poetry or music or whatever, art. You know, this line symbolizes the divide between man and woman, or mm -hmm. our, uh, you know, the blue represents the, the water, and, you know, all that symbolism that's used for, for writing grants. Um, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't really have much use for it. Except on a grant application, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, except on a grant application. Yes, yes. Okay, so right now you're telling us that uh, your primary concern is recording the music that you have created. That's been an ongoing project for you. For as long as I've known you, you've been recording, and you're recording long before that. You're one of the most recording guys that I know. Why do you do that? What does that do for you? Are you doing that for the world? Are you doing that for you? What's that about? Because not everyone does it. Not everyone believes in it. Well, um, what I'm most interested in doing is attempting to create with the music that I create the feelings that I've experienced from other people's music. That's interesting. So I'm on this, I'm always on this quest to try to recreate emotional responses that, that I have to other people's music with my own music. And, and that's, that's why I do it. Do you uh, think that's weird? Have you ever heard anyone else express that's why they do what they do? I don't know. <laughs> I hadn't really thought about it in those terms before, but that's, ex that's precisely why I do it. I mean, I don't, I don't think in and of itself it's weird. I think it's probably fairly common, but at the moment I don't recall anyone putting it that yeah. way. But you know, in a way, that's where we all come from. We hear music first. We hear music and it, and it, and it touches us, I mean, yeah. very deeply in, in very precise ways. And, and to try to figure out how to recreate that, I find, I find very fascinating. Yeah, that's uh, food for thought. Michael Blackovich. <laughs> let us um, let us let you continue get back to this journey we've heard a little bit of what uh, you're involved in now yeah. in your life and we sort of left you in St. Louis at the military yeah. academy or school that you don't want to say much about yeah. I'm going to have to talk to you about that at some other time. That's just, <laughs> you're one of the least military kind of guys I know. Yeah. So, um, take us on a path, how you got from there to here. And give us some, uh, was it at all enjoyable? Um, well... I think the I think probably the most important uh, moment of my life occurred in the summer of 1969, when I was able to play in a professional orchestra, Oliver Nelson music with with uh, Phil Woods as a soloist. Hmm. I had never. I had never really played with professional musicians before. How old were you in 1969? I was, if you don't mind saying. I was 18. 18. 
So that was that was uh, that was an amazing, and that was that was an amazing thing. I mean, I had spent I spent six weeks with Oliver Nelson and in a clinic. Actually, Ron Carter was there for the entire time too. Were you guys sick or something? <laughs> Uh, it was interesting. It was it was a very in interesting experience. Anyway, um, so that cemented cemented the whole. Uh, Hold on, tell us how it was yeah. a very interesting experience. Give us give us a little bit of that because you're you're missing, mentioning some. Uh, you're mentioning a giant. Yeah. That you got to spend six weeks with in St. Louis. Yeah. Um, it was. Um, I, you know, I, I was I was Im immersed in a uh, in what became you know in a odd sort of way my future. I mean, I up till then I I never really I never really got to uh, got to experience experience that. Uh, so it was it was quite. Uh, Quite unique, I guess, um, and transformational, in a way. I, I w sort of wasted it in in some respects. I would go and hear Oliver Nelson play every week, because he did a he did a quartet every every. Uh, we did a concert every week, and and he and after the big band played, he would play, and I would go and listen to it. But I, I didn't pay as much of attention as I should have at the time. Is that what you mean when you say you sort of wasted it? What, what do you mean? By well, that? some, some, sometimes, yeah. I thought I did. I thought I wasted some experiences that I should have taken more seriously. Oh, uh, whether I could have taken, could have digested more than I did. I, who knows? Maybe I couldn't. Maybe I was, I was taking in all I could at the time, which is probably more likely. Because I was, I was pretty naive and and. Uh, and uh, not very knowledgeable. Well, you're only 18. Yeah. And in St. Louis, but it's got more to be with 18 than being in St. Yeah. Louis. Yeah. So, so, um, so the, the I, I was studying. You know, I had been I had been studying now for a couple of years with the principal trombonist of the St. Louis Symphony, and he suggested that I go to North Texas State. So I went to North Texas State. Um, and then, um, and I had a good friend, I had a good, uh, a good friend in St. Louis who was also a trombone player who, who, uh, went to Eastman and, uh, and then ended up going to Los Angeles and he wanted to study with, um, I wanted to study with Carl Fontana. He was he studied with with uh, Lloyd Ulliate and uh, and uh, Frank Rossellino, and he wanted to study with uh, uh, Carl Fontana. So, and then there was another uh, another trombone player at North Texas State who was also interested in going to Los Angeles. So. I ended up going to Los Angeles um, instead of going to New York City or London, which were the other two choices I had. Did you uh, finish your degree work in no, North Texas? I just stopped. Now, why was London a choice? That's that's curious to me. I mean, I know it's one of the musical capitals of the world. Well, you, I, you know, I it? thought I thought well, maybe that would be a good place to go. You know, they speak the same language. You're in Europe, but they speak the same language, so it's yeah, it's not as as big a culture shock as as doing something else. But I talked to a trom a studio trombone player there, who didn't encourage me to come. Mm. What were his reasons? Do you recall? Well, he didn't think it was that. He didn't think that it was that good there. Uh -huh. um, so, 
I didn't. Uh, I didn't do it. I went. Uh, I went to Los Angeles, and then. Well, looking uh, back from this vantage point, do you have um, any? Uh, do you question that decision coming here as opposed to going to New York or London? Um, I think for me personally, and, and, I, and I suspect for many, that um, regardless of the stops along the way, I think you basically end up in the same place. Uh-huh. Um, you... Um, I, I mean, I, I, I will say the three, three things that, that uh, have been uh, somewhat negative for me have been, one, I play trombone. Hallelujah. Two, I live in Los Angeles. Uh-huh. And three, I play with people that nobody knows. <laughs> Those those are the three really strong deficits uh -huh. that, uh, that that have caused me to be in I think in the in the situation that I'm in and the situation that I'm in is is basically I think of myself as being a really a true underground musician. Uh huh. Um, and you'd rather be above ground. I know I certainly would. Well, I don't. Um, I would. I would just uh, sometimes like uh, people to return my phone. Calls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's just common courtesy, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. They could return the call and say, "I don't want to talk to you." Yeah. So anyway. Um, I don't, why did I why did I say that? Uh, oh yeah, it was it was referring to uh, the trip and how how different it would have been. Yeah. I don't know that it would have been it would have been that that different. I mean, if if I had been in New York, I would be probably playing with with people that are more well known, and I would be more well known, I suppose. Um, but I'd still be playing trombone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so it would only be two thirds different. Actually, I said to someone earlier today, via email, but uh, basically the same thing. You know, at, no, actually, when it, at the bottom level, I play the tuba, and that just determines so much because it's a tuba. Yeah. And. Uh, what is available for the tuba is what it is and will always be yeah. because of its nature. Okay, Michael Blackovich, um, you have had um, some experience in your life with some major figures. You've mentioned uh, a few of them already. Tell us about Gil Evans. Um, he was a very nice man. Um, I, um, I've called up a lot of people in my life, um, and most, most of them have been, have been very friendly, I, uh, to the point of being able to actually meet them and talk to them in person. Uh, but I think he was, he was by far the, the friendliest and most, um, down to earth. Michael Blackovich, you say you've caught up many people. Is that how you got in touch with him? Is that how you you two came together? <clears throat> well, I, a, a friend of mine um, uh, knew him and and I uh, used his name. I don't know necessarily that I needed to do that, but I did it, and so I I was. Uh, I was introduced to him through someone else. And what was your relationship with him? Did you study with him? Did you play with his ensembles? What, what was the story? 
I just hung out with him. I mean, I would I would bring uh, I brought stuff over and uh, he would uh, he would listen to it. I tried to get him to write liner notes for my first record, but he wouldn't do it. Um, but I I played uh, I mostly played my music for him. And um, you played it on trombone, or no, no, I played recordings of it. Were you living in New York at the time? Where where did this take place? I was living, uh, yeah, I was living in New York at the time. And how long a period was this? Uh, that one was six months. Six months. Yeah. So he, you'd go over, play your music, and he would like respond to it? He would or? respond, yeah, he would respond. To uh -huh. it. And, uh, That's a really and unique experience, don't you think? Very generous. Yeah, it was very generous. Very, very generous, yeah. Yeah, he was a very, very kind man. How old was he around at that time? Well, I guess close to 70, I suppose. Oh, quite advanced. What age was he when he died? You know, I should know that, but I don't. I don't know. I don't remember. Have you played much of his music? Uh, very little, actually. Very little of his music, uh -huh. except on the CD player. Uh -huh. uh, no. I've, I asked him countless times to play in the band, but nothing, uh, nothing ever came of it. You had a band in New York? I had a band in New York, but I, I, was, I was asked him if I could play in his band. Oh, I see. I see. I see. What were you doing in New York? What possessed you? <clears throat> Well, that's, um, I felt, uh, this was 1978. 1978. This time. Um, I, I felt that I needed to go there and, and really, uh, really see what jazz was like. Because I didn't, I didn't get a feeling that, jazz in Los Angeles was what I was what I thought it would should be so um, this is this is sort of an odd story um, my my wife at the time was um, was rehearsing uh, was rehearsing a show with um, uh, the entertainer guy. What's his name? The entertainer guy. That's the a... guy that wrote the entertainer. Oh, Joplin? No, no, no. The the movie. Yeah. The God, I can't think of his name. The director? No, no. The composer, Hamlish, Marvin Hamlish. Uh huh. She was she was doing a. Uh, she was doing a, a. She was. She was working as an accompanist for Marvin Hamlish. And Marvin Hamlish was taking this show to to Broadway. And he had told her that she was going to go. Uh, so I was talking to the, to the, um, to the contractor, <laughs> who was going to be. Who was going to be the uh, uh, the person contracting that show? <clears throat> and then uh, Marvin Hamlish uh, reneged on my wife, and my wife ended up suing Marvin Hamlish. <laughs> and <laughs> and the uh, the contractor would only talk to me about trying to get her to to drop the lawsuit. So. That was one of the reasons I went to New York. I see. It wasn't the only reason, but one of the reasons. Um, so, um, yeah, I got I got to experience uh, what I thought jazz should be, and and realized, and it sort of validated what I was doing. So when I did come back, uh, 
I was uh, re-energized uh, quite a bit. I started making, started recording records and stuff. And were you able to, or to what degree were you able in Los Angeles to find players who could share in your vision of what uh, jazz should be or what you wanted your music to be? Was, was that a struggle? Is that a struggle? Is it a constant struggle? Or by now do you have like a stable of people that you go to? Um, well, y yes, I, there's, there's, uh, there's people that I, that I prefer over others. I'm sure there's new people here that I don't know that would be, would be good, but, but because I do so very little, I, I feel much more of an obligation to, to use the people that, that I'm familiar and used over the years. Um, and all of them, you know, are, are specific to certain things that I do. Um, I don't know that, I don't know that there's anyone that does everything. Uh, I mean, including me, I, you know. It's dangerous, I think, yeah. a person that does everything. It can be, yeah. If they be. tell you that, I, I always figure they're lying, or they just are stupid. Yeah. Well, uh, Los Angeles, I mean, the studio musician, that's really their definition is, is they do everything, and... It's not really true. I don't think it's really true. Yeah, I mean, they stay pretty much in the middle. I mean, the middle, although the middle is pretty big, uh, but, and when there are, when they have to do go to the edges, they often get people who are on the edges doing those things. Yeah. I mean, you know, to be honest, when people ask me what kind of music I play, my standard response is whatever they write the check for. So, I am guilty of that too, but on the other hand, I will say to people who are asking me to do something on the phone, I'll ask questions about the gig, and there are people who I say, you need to get someone else. Yeah. I'm really not the guy for that. And if I have a name, I'll give them the name. Yeah, well, I'm, you're, you're <laughs> there are unfortunately people who don't recognize their limitations and... Mm -hmm and uh, do try to do things that they shouldn't be doing. Now, Michael Blakovich, we are uh, approaching the official end of our taping, but we don't really care about that because we have plenty of other time. So there, there are a few things I want to get to. Now, one of them is we have a mutual friend named Christopher Garcia. Yes. Christopher likes to tell a story about you in New York and Miles Davis. <laughs> but I've never heard the story from you. Yeah. Do you want to tell us that story or not? Sure. I, I had a, a friend, Rick Steinberg, who lived on the Upper West Side. He played saxophone. And he lived next door to Miles Davis in the next in the next walk up. And I was uh, I was staying with him one time, and I lost his key. So I was waiting. I was waiting outside, sitting on the stairs, for him for somebody to come back. And Miles Davis walked by and asked me if I needed help. <laughs> and what did you say to him? I said, no, I was fine. And That's what did he I say said. to you? I said, okay. Ah. Yeah. That's um, curious in its way. 
It's curious in its way. Obviously, you knew who he was. And, uh... I guess, I mean, you know, I, I passed up a moment to actually, I guess, chat with him. Um, but I, I, at that moment, I didn't have anything really to say to him. Um, so I didn't. Yeah. He might not have chatted with you. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was, I thought it was very, uh, very thoughtful, you know, that he, he took the time to ask, you know, if everything was okay. Yeah. Yeah. Was he just walking down the street, or I guess yeah, you don't know? Yeah, he was walking back. He was walking back to his place. Uh-huh. Yeah. Huh. Curious. Um, you have mentioned your parents. For me, like my, not my parents, but my guardian, was very supportive of what I did. And the only other person who's been interviewed in this series, Joseph Mitchell, his parents were. His father was a musician, mm -hmm. Joseph's, you know. His father was a trumpet player. Played with Basie and folks like that. Um, I didn't know until I did this series that uh, his father actually played with Coltrane. Uh -huh. Coltrane was just another guy in the band, you know. Yeah. Um, and so you say your parents were supportive. What do, you, what do you think that was about? Do you think that was just because they loved their kid and they wanted, and he was staying out of jail, he had something to keep him out of jail, and that was him, or what do you... Yeah, I, I, um, yeah, I, I guess, I guess in a way all parents are, are, you know, freaked out and concerned that their parents are going to become uh, less than desirables. Their kids. Yeah, yeah I, th I thought, um, I thought they were overly that way. Uh, but they were, I mean, they were incredibly, incredibly supportive. Always, always very, very supportive of, uh, of the stuff. And in fact, it's, uh, <laughs> oh, unless somebody's heard the first record, nobody would really have the, have the, have the true sense of what I'm saying, but when my parents got the got the first record, they went to the neighbors and played it for them. <laughs> so I I can't imagine what that was like. <laughs> yeah, that well, that's something. That's really something. Very much so. So you, as I think I said. You're one of the most recording guys I know. Um, in my life, I'd say there's three folks who convinced me to record and record often, whether I put the recordings out or not. That's you, Glenn Horiuchi, and uh, Vinnie Golia. You know, you three guys are, and in the case of Glenn, was recording fools. You feel it's worthwhile, you know. I'm, I'm. I still think it's worthwhile. Putting them out is a is a different question. I, I don't know if I'll ever pay to put out another CD, but that's got to do with um, advancing technology. But uh, who listens to it, and and who cares, and why do you care? Um. Yeah, I. You know. Uh, I think of them sort of as as children in a way. I mean, they they are created and then they have their own lives, whether they end up in a trash can or whether they end up in somebody's CD player constantly. You know, who knows? I mean, it's it's all of that. It's you know all of that and everything in between. Um, it is. I, I do find it. I do find it uh, fascinating. Having done this for so long, you know, you never. You just never know what people are going to like, what they're not going to like. Um, 
So it, it's, it's a constant uh, learning uh, situation for me um, in terms of, of the CDs and, and what what happens. I, I you know I make a, I make a serious attempt to get them out into the world because the, the, the uh, market is so incredibly tiny that, that they need to go into the world as opposed to just existing in a in a very small area like Los Angeles. Yeah. And the CD allows that is the only way to allow that to happen. Uh, you can't uh, you can't invite somebody from uh, Albania to come to a concert in Eagle Rock. You know, and expect them to come. <laughs> there you go. You can invite them, but it's, it's not likely they're going to show up. But the, but they can certainly uh, hear the CD on the radio, or or even own the CD if one so desired. Yeah, or in this day and age, hear it on the web. Yeah, yeah. It's um. It's not a shock to me, but it's always interesting to me how far these projects actually travel, you know, when you least expect it. Someone from the northernmost point on the planet knows something yeah. that I've done, whether it's my own project or with someone else. It's not that it happens often, but... Uh, yes, it's, refresh it's refreshing. It's refreshing. Yeah. To know that, that there's somebody else who is at least a little bit like you. Yeah. In terms of their preferences. Yeah. Well, Michael Lekovich, um, this is your time to say anything you want to say about anything, actually. You can take some time <laughs> and uh, say what you want to say about something. Something you want to say to the youth of America, or to the old people, or to the folks in Albania, yeah. or to trombone players, why you should or should not have a green trombone, yeah. you know, whatever you want to say. Well, first of all, I think, I think uh, everyone should explore their creative side, however you do that whether it's knitting or uh, cooking, whatever it happens to be. I think it's important to express yourself in other ways other than through language. And, and also I think we should, uh, we should experience the arts, or not, no, let me say it this way. Don't forget to experience the arts emotionally. Don't think that you have to have a doctorate in music in order to appreciate music or painting or whatever it is. Just just take from it what you you know view it in your own way and and uh, and take from it what you can emotionally and and maybe some way you'll be able to incorporate it in your life. Do you um, feel that there's a deficit of that in the overall population? I think I think there I think there is a huge uh, huge deficit in in that. I think society has become a place where money is accumulated in order to attempt to buy happiness. I I don't think I don't think people often enjoy what they do to make money uh, or even attempt to try to enjoy what they do to make money. They make money so that they can buy or attempt to buy happiness, joy in their life. And I think that's uh, I think that's really a shame. I think that's why so many people live vicariously through movie stars or sports people or whatever because 
they don't see their lives as being that interesting. And, you know, I think, I think they could be interesting to them. I mean, you know, you don't have to break the land speed record or, or go to Mars or anything. I mean, you know, just, just being you can be, can be quite rewarding. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. I agree. Although I'd like to go to Mars. <laughs> I might even be willing to be one of those uh, one-way trip Mars persons, you know. Yeah. I mean, if you're driving to San Francisco and you get hit by a semi, it's a one-way trip. You might as well be going to Mars. Yeah. You know. Yeah. What an experience that would be, being on Mars. You know, the transit time would be a little rough. Yeah. The thing about, uh, the thing that I've, I've noticed about uh, traveling is that, you know, it's always you. <laughs> Regardless of where you go, you're still you. I mean, it may look different out there, but uh -huh. in here, it's still you. <laughs> well, you know what's interesting about that is when you travel, at least I have found, you really get a sense of who you are. Yeah. You know, if, if you're in the most strange place, or it doesn't have to be that strange, but if you're in many different places, you have to come face to face with who you are, which gives you an opportunity, if you don't like aspects of who you are, to first recognize them and then uh, do some work towards changing them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, I think that's that is the advantage to traveling is 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 to learning how to being able to learn how you want to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when when you're in a strange place, if it's a really strange place, <laughs> you have nothing to fall back on. Yeah. Except you. Yeah. And you can find you very wanting at times and. So then you're going to have to do something about it, and you kind of have to do something about it immediately, mm -hmm. especially if you're not coming back in 24 hours or 36 hours. Yeah. You kind of have to get it together real quick. Real quick. Okay, Michael Blackovich, well, we would like to thank you, thank and you. I would like to thank you also thank for giving you. your time. It's been a very uh, rewarding and uh, interesting conversation. And for our viewers, stay tuned. There will be someone else showing someone else, up yeah. in this chair. I don't know who yet. I don't want to tease you with possibilities. Live long and prosper. Don't take any wooden nickels. Don't eat any yellow snow, especially if you're in St. Louis. Thank you very much.